Welcome to Raisina Idea Spot. Uh, these are conversations we have on the sidelines of Raisina. And today I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Honorable Minister Marcelo Eberard from Mexico with us. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for coming here. Best thank you for, for the, yes, the thank, you for, thank you for joining Raisina. It's very interesting forum, I should say. Uh, Minister, let me uh, start asking you, you know, my Mexico is, uh, you know, we, we're talking about multipolarity. In the morning also we discussed multipolarity. And Mexico is often talked of as the new pole in the multipolar world. It's the 15th largest economy in nominal terms, has its heft, has its weight. And uh, it, is, it, is, it has a presence in Central America. Now my question to you is, what is Mexico's strategy outside the Americas? Is Mexico thinking in terms of the Indo-Pacific? Is it thinking of how to engage in the area in larger terms of sustainability, climate action, and other well, other other market you options? You know, we we are working very hard in, in regarding, for instance, climate action strategy. Uh, we had the COP in Cancun, and and now we are promoting a. a, a very important measures in not not only in North America but in general. <clears throat> so we're in, engaged with climate action, with ocean sustainability, and in regional terms, regarding the regions of the world, we are increasing presence in the Pacific area. Mm -hmm. For instance, Mexico has the presidency pro tempore past year of the Pacific Alliance with uh, Chile, Colombia. Uh, Peru, and now Singapore, then Costa Rica and other countries. So the presence in, in the Pacific and the, the commerce in the Pacific is growing very fastly in Mexico. So we need to deploy an, uh, our strategy in the Indo-Pacific too. You spoke about climate change and uh, you know, financing for climate action is a very contentious point. Well, and we insisted in the past COP we have a very interesting uh, talks and conversations with the uh, European Union, especially with France, and then with the United States regarding this issue. We in, in Latin America organized two years ago the Adaptation Fund. So we have money and we are supporting the Caribbean countries, which are in risk because of the sea level. But what happens with the uh, figures that we listen each cup? Mm -hmm. It is not working. So uh, this year, I think that this is going to be very, very, a very important part of the agenda. This issue, uh, the commitment from the developed countries, as they name it, it themselves, <laughs> with yeah. the rest of the world, in order to finance special adaptation funds for many countries, which are in danger right now. So tell me, you know, uh, just staying on the same topic of climate finance and climate action, we are today in a world which is uh, facing you know, geopolitical struggles, which are impacting economies to a very large extent. And the fiscal space which developing countries, emerging economies have to actually work on climate action is getting more and more constrained. Now, where does Mexico see itself in this situation? Well, we have, you know, in the case of Mexico, which is not the same case maybe of many countries, we have an uh, important increase in the foreign investment. And at the same time, we have uh, a very good ratio between income and debt. Our debt is very low. Our income is growing. So we have some space, fiscal space, in order to finance not adaptation, but mitigation mm -hmm. measures in the next years, mainly energy, clean energy, Electromobility and other initiatives, but regarding the global situation, uh, it's amazing that the is it the extreme complex architecture of the financing from developed countries to the rest of the world, and why they should do this thing because it's a fair it's a fair play. I mean, United States is responsible for maybe thirty percent of the emissions right now. So it's not only because you are rich, it's because you are generating mm -hmm. a very important part of the problem. So I think that uh, this is going to be a, a key debate this year in the COP, as uh, at least for Latin American and Caribbean countries, to, to, to really pressure on this. Yeah. Because 
every, every country in our region increases their NDCs in Egypt. But what about the financing? Now, Mexico, you know, is part of the international, the comprehensive development plan, which is between the four central Latin American countries, which uh, uh, which have been severely affected uh, primarily by large amounts of uh, labor mobility, migration, and issues of sustainability economies, which can, which do not have enough uh, spurt in them to move fast enough. They, and Mexico is taking the lead, perhaps, in this area and getting partnerships with ECLAC and all the others, the UN agency, to try and do something for this area. Now, migration is a problem. Migration is a problem. Labor mobility is a problem. How is it impacting the relationship between Central America and its larger, richer neighbor? Well, you know, we have... uh, The situation right now is like this one. In the United States, you have a decrease in the demographic growth. So the United States, which is the largest economy in the world until now, you have, they need something like 2 million people, I think, per year in order to maintain their economic growth. They have only 0.3% of the uh, demographic growth per year. So you need more and more people. So the question is, how are you going to organize this? There are two ways, mainly. The one way is, uh, the let's say, the architecture of the past century. Mm-hmm. We don't allow people to come. But if you come, you are going to remain here. But this has created a large black market, a lot of human suffering, uh, human rights abuses. Okay, this, this is a possibility. As a matter of fact, this is a situation right now. The other one is to establish a, a, an organized, safe, and regular process which the people can understand what the rules are in order to avoid the black market or the criminal network. So, fortunately, the Biden administration recently took action in this direction, the second one. And uh, you have some results, some figures, very positive ones, encouraging ones, that uh, you have a decreasing in the, let's say, irregular flow, the first that I described. And uh, you have a new kind of management of the second one. So I hope that the next future this can be uh, the, the answer from the United States to change the, the past century model to another one in this century. And what are we going with Central America? With Central America, we are in, um, expanding the legal ways to work in Mexico. Uh, the refu- refugee uh, tradition of Mexico has been expanded or facilitated to the people in case of they need refugee. So we have uh, more than tripled the refugee figures this year than three or four years ago. So, and then uh, also we have a direct social investment in Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, which are direct uh, salaries that we are paying for young people working there with their companies, with their public institutions. We pay for that in order that they learn how to work. They, uh, they learn new skills. And uh, we are investing also in the rural areas for people which uh, maybe they don't, they don't have any other option than try to migrate to the United States, mostly irregularly. So we are investing in their communities in order to improve the possibilities to get the right to, to remain in your own town. town. So those are the, the, the main measures that Mexico has, has uh, implemented in those countries. And we have a, an independent evaluation from the United Nations, and we have promising results. 
in order to show that it's not only an idea or a political position. Instead, it's a, a public policy with success in the short term. So we, ha we are seeing uh, uh, decreasing, decreasing flows of about 11, 15% with those kind of measures. So it works. It's, not, it, it's more costly to have the contention approach. Yeah. But uh, we are showing this to our own uh, Congress and our own public opinion because always is a problematic issue to invest in our country and also to the United States, which is our main partner. Well, countries need to grow together. I mean, it's uh, yeah. in a situation where countries are not growing together fast enough at the same pace, you are going to have problems. Labor problems, migration problems are bound to occur. Security problems. And security problems are a consequence of all that. Crime is a consequence. I so, think so. Which spills over. Crimes, drug abuse, you know, it, it, it's all linked to each other. Now, uh, looking at larger Latin America, there, there is, there, you know, I was speaking of constrained fiscal space. There are countries which are having problems there, major problems. Yeah? Uh, those problems naturally are going to be spilling over into neighboring countries. And they are spilling over into neighboring countries. Uh, where does Mexico see itself in this? Well, we are trying to help um, the countries in Latin America that uh, have political problems or the risk of instability or confrontation, to find out dialogue and solutions. Not always is, has been easy way this way, but it's our tradition. It's uh, the case that uh, Mexico implemented in Central America in the past with El Salvador, for instance. Um, we are working right now in order to look for an agreement between oppositions and the government in Venezuela or the guerrilla in uh, Colombia and the new government of uh, President Petro looking for peace. And I should say that uh, those initiatives or to send a plane and rescue President Evo Morales in front of the risk of, he, he could be killed by, by army or I don't know, other forces. So you, you can imagine the disaster there, almost a civil war. So always we are trying to respect in each country, but trying if they allow us or call us to um, reach a dialogue and agreements between different forces as a solution for the problems in, in the region. Uh, we are against sanctions, the sanctions against Cuba, well, 62 years. Suffering and nothing happens except migration and suffering for the people. Even in the pandemic, uh, they didn't have diesel for their hotel, uh, hospitals. So you can imagine. For, and, and, and so the, the, this is the position of Mexico in general in Latin America. Uh, last quick question. Where is the relationship between India and Mexico today? Well, in the best moment in the past 20 years, I think, uh, there are similarities that there are similarities in our positions in the global scene in front of the war in ukraine and other issues the climate financing uh, other many many issues we have similar posi uh, positions uh, we have more and more uh, investment and commerce between our countries recently we have uh, new initiatives in pharmaceuticals and medical equipment technology so I think that this relation is going to grow steadily in an important way for the next years. So I'm very optimistic, I should say, for the future of our, our relationship. Uh, so thank you, Minister. I hope the relationship with India and Mexico continues to grow deeper and deeper. And ORF has many more opportunities to work with you and get you back into the Raisana Dialogue time and time again. Sure. Thank you so much for being here. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you.